Thank you. Thanks for being a part of this. Foregoing a face mask, Vice President Pence turning heads after touring the famed Mayo Clinic, apparently defying hospital policy by refusing to cover his face. His defense, he doesn't need to wear a mask because he receives regular testing. Since I, I don't have the coronavirus, I, I thought it'd be a good opportunity for me to be here. Americans lining up for tests, waiting for hours at walk-in medical centers that now offer antibody testing as we now surpass more than a million confirmed cases in the U.S. Refusing to reopen. While some state leaders are allowing non-essential businesses to get back to business, others are sacrificing profits for safety. We'll talk to one restaurant owner from Atlanta who is part of a movement going against Georgia's governor. Security warning. As America works and plays online, is someone spying on your Zoom calls? What pandemic? We're getting a look at parts of the country that have not felt the full impact of the coronavirus. Our Matt Gutman takes us on a trip across some roads less traveled. And never mind field of dreams, tonight we're talking about a field of hope. Good evening, everyone, and thanks so much for streaming with us. I'm Lindsay Davis. They say timing is everything, and that is certainly true at this moment. While we are united in our eagerness for this pandemic to pass, we are divided by the when of it all. And there are multiple timelines now emerging. So many are calling for a return to normalcy. But the CDC with a warning today that deaths are likely to continue to rise quickly without proper social distancing. We're seeing scenes like this outside North Carolina's General Assembly protesters calling for the rollback of safety regulations while workers in scrubs and masks, they stand in silence against them. And in Arkansas, the line of cars for a drive-up food bank backed all the way up to the highway. The event was scheduled to last for four hours, but ran out of food after just the first hour. But we begin tonight with our Tom Yamas on the surging testing capabilities and how that could be key to reopening. Today, as the number of American coronavirus cases tops 1 million, the staff at one of New York's hardest hit hospitals gathering outside for a moment of unity. Soaring overhead, the Air Force Thunderbirds and the Navy's Blue Angels, saluting the essential workers who have sacrificed so much. We've seen the good, the bad and the ugly in all of this. Uh, and the good is beautiful. In New York today, for the first time in more than a month, the number of new hospitalizations dipping below 1,000, down 70% since the peak several weeks ago. The governor now examining ways to reopen the state at the epicenter of this crisis. We want to reopen, but we want to do it without infecting more people or overwhelming the hospital system. Public health experts say the key to that is testing. Today in Manhattan, a two hour wait outside this urgent care center offering tests for coronavirus and antibodies. This long line is proof that testing remains an issue in places like New York. And it's not just at the single location. We're seeing and hearing about lines all over the city. The lack of testing a problem throughout this pandemic. Mia Runjan says her sister, Rana Zoe, a New York City school teacher, was turned down twice before she finally got a test. It was positive. Rana Zoe fought the virus in the hospital for a month. Monday, she lost her battle. Now in Philadelphia, an effort to expand testing in underserved African-American communities. Hi, how are you? I'm Dr. Can I see your form? 200 cars of people packing this church parking lot. Some came on foot, sitting in chairs six feet apart. Perfect. Dr. Stanford explaining to her team why increased testing is so important to stopping the spread of COVID-19 in the community. So we had a police officer, positive, right? Protecting and serving and now going out and he's positive. Governors across the country begging the Trump administration to help them expand testing. Feeling the pressure, the president announced he's ramping up federal efforts. If we want to get our country open and the testing is not going to be a problem at all. The administration says they want to make sure states are able to test at least 2% of the population. Some experts say that's not nearly enough. Vice President Mike Pence today traveling to meet with doctors at the Mayo Clinic. He didn't wear a mask, even though the clinic says they informed his staff that was the policy. Tonight, parts of the country continue to reopen. Georgia setting the pace with restaurants now welcoming customers to sit down and have a meal. Beauty salons open for business. It all makes Tarika Parks shake her head. 
The mother of two survived coronavirus and thinks it's way too soon for Georgia to reopen. It's impossible to practice social distancing in a nail shop. Alabama, where COVID cases are rising, isn't moving to reopen as quickly, but things are moving. Today, Governor Kay Ivey announcing many businesses can open at the end of the week at a reduced capacity. Restaurants still take out for now. In California, where the battle is still hard fought, Governor Gavin Newsom says the state will eventually reopen slowly in phases. We believe we are weeks, not months away from making meaningful modifications. For the country and for patients, the road to recovery is long. And tonight, we're hoping for more endings like this. In Detroit, Dr. Scott Katz, who treated some of the hospital's first COVID patients, finally heading home himself. And Tom Yamas joins us now. Tommy, it's clear and has been just how important accurate testing is in this effort to reopen up the country. We heard from Dr. Fauci today about the availability of testing and when everyone might really have access to it. What's he saying? You know, Dr. Fauci acknowledged that the system is not perfect right now, but he says we will get there. He says he's being told by the end of May, early June, anyone who needs a test can get a test. He says at least that's what he's being told. But, Lindsay, you can see here just behind me, we've been here all day. People have been waiting for up to two hours to get either an antibody test or a coronavirus test. So people want to get tested right now, and that's part of the frustration right now. It's also part of the reason why it's taken so long for states to reopen and for businesses to get going as well. They want to make sure people are healthy before they open their doors. All right, he's Lindsay. saying end of May, early June. Okay, Tom Yamas, thanks so much. Since we've all been so limited in our movements, it's rather easy to forget just how different this pandemic looks in different parts of the country. And while we've seen many cities overtaken by the fight against the coronavirus hunkering down and staying in, there are some parts of the country where the effects of the crisis haven't even been felt. Our Matt Gutman visited some of these communities while on a road trip home and filed this report. Whipped by the wind, the welcome booth at this Badlands campground may seem like the loneliest place on the planet. Okay, so you need it for two nights. Except Cedar Pass campground caretaker Gio Faviola, stationed in her booth along with that jug of hand sanitizer, has company coming. It's not available on Saturday night, no. Gio drove out here from Massachusetts. Now, she'd been planning to flee an accounting job anyway. Then came COVID. Being out here, I'm not as, I don't see it as much as if I was back in Massachusetts or in a bigger city. Yeah. So I'm not as exposed to it. I get, ex I, it becomes real to me when I go to the food center to restock my supplies where they only let one person in at a time. That's because locals here are desperate to keep the virus out. And this county here has no cases whatsoever. Oh, so this is a county with this zero cases. Jackson County has no cases. We've never had a case. We've tried to maintain that case because once we get a case, it could mean the closure of all of us. We are the concession of the um, national parks. And they have been busy. So-called COVID refugees coming from all over. This man had just pulled up from Baltimore. You stopped seeing the masks? We stopped seeing masks in, um, as we got further uh, west into Minnesota. Up until then, we were seeing them pretty consistently. By the time we got within 100 miles of uh, the Minnesota-South Dakota border, we they didn't even have X's on the floors in most of the convenience stores and gas stations and stuff. My producer, Robert Zepeda, and I spent the past week driving from Minneapolis back to Los Angeles, visiting parts of the country that have had few or no COVID cases. Places where almost no one wears a mask, where people still try to shake your hand and go to indoor water parks like this one in Rapid City, South Dakota, and where people still have places to go. Encountering a surprising amount of traffic in Denver, where there are over 2,500 cases. And there, zipping across South Dakota's grasslands, we found Cedar Pass and Geo, the accountant turned campground caretaker, who has been diligently spacing out her campers. They're just on the road, trying to stay isolated. We saw spacious RVs and college kids pitching tents. Were you cooped up in Minnesota? Is there like a stay, a shelter at home order? Uh, in the yeah, a little bit. There's nothing really open. We then headed west from the Badlands Castles of Clay and Rock to Mount Rushmore. And there we found the Carl family from Iowa 
who had the presidents mostly to themselves. It's open. I don't feel bad about using it. Yeah. So, oh. You know, that's the way it is. And if people didn't want to be around other people, then they'll go to public places. Westward, the Black Hills giving way to wide open plains. Okay, our third state, Wyoming. South Dakota and Wyoming are two of just eight states without statewide shelter at home orders. We stopped in tiny Hartville, Wyoming, which says it's the oldest incorporated town in the state, a place everyone knows each other. Tasha runs the post office here, which still has those brass P.O. boxes. If you're sick, stay home. Other than that, open everything back up. These small businesses are struggling. I, I, I think it's time. Yeah. So in America, one size doesn't fit all. No, us small people are completely different than L.A. or New York or bigger cities. Across the street, the owners of the Miners and Stockman Steakhouse, Scott and Christine, felt the same way. From there to the county seat, Wheatland, Wyoming. Platt County here is the kind of place where people still reach out to shake your hand. It's got a population of 9,000 zero COVID positive cases. That's one reason the EMS director told us he's got to treat everybody from the outside like us, like they have the plague. And when you talk to folks here, they say they have been social distancing all their lives because places like this are so rural. That EMS chief, his name is Terry Stevenson. You're from out of state, so we're gonna treat you like you have the plague. Out here, he says, People rely on their common sense. Would you say the town is open, closed? I mean, how, how would you describe Wheatland right now? Uh, we have been impacted. I would say that uh, most people would describe it as a partial closure. The governor did not give a stay-at-home order. His explanation was when it's raining, uh, nobody should have to tell you to put on a raincoat. So we've got a disease going around. Nobody should tell you you have to stay home. But eventually, he knows, COVID will come here, too. Down the street, Dan Brecht owns the Wandering Hermit bookshop. We've done pretty well. You know, people who don't have anything to do read books, or they want to get a jigsaw puzzle, or they get a board game. But Brecht worries about the rest of the town. Ned Resch is the CEO of the Platte County Memorial Hospital, one of the friendly folks who innocently reached out to shake my hand. When we first met just a few minutes ago, the, your inclination was to oh, reach out and yeah. shake my hand. It's such, a, it's such a habit, right? He says he's been locked and loaded for weeks, but no COVID patients yet. At heart, they're caregivers. They want to provide care. They want to touch the patient. They want to care for the patient. And so on the one hand, I think there's this, um, there's this you know, anxiousness, as you, as you said, to, to provide care for the patient. But on the other hand, I think there's a lot of gratitude <laughs> that it hasn't impacted our yeah. community and we've been safe from it. Rural hospitals across the country bracing for the same. The earlier they are in the COVID outbreak, the longer they must forego revenue generating treatments and the more likely they are to face financial collapse. One of the good things is we're part of a larger system, Banner Healthcare, and so we're able to draw on support from Banner Health and um, not only just for the, the financial side of things, but also lessons learned around COVID. Back at the Cedar Pass campground, we continue our walkabout with Geo. Hazel? Hazel had hitched her trailer and set out a few weeks ago. <laughs> Are you trying to stay in sort of COVID light states? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, actually, that, yeah, that's what I did. I looked at who was lighter blue, and, and it was South Dakota, Montana, and Wyoming. <laughs> yeah. Almost everyone we spoke to believed that COVID would come, even here to the wind beaten badlands, and that no one would see normal anytime soon because we've never experienced anything like this before and a lot of people will be suffering from that PTSD that, okay, should I go out take one, to take one step out and risk that? I don't think, I think it's gonna be a slow going, trying to get everything going back to normal, what the new normal is. Our thanks to Matt for that piece. And for more on what this ramped up testing is telling us and what we can do with this information, we're joined now by Dr. Todd Ellerin, Director of Infectious Diseases at South Shore Health in Massachusetts and an ABC News contributor. Thanks so much for joining us. Hi, Lindsay. I think we have him on the phone. Okay, well, as we reported, the administration wants to help states test at least 2% of their populations for the virus. What would that accomplish? And is that adequate, just 2%? Well, again, when we talk about testing, we have to ask ourselves, are we talking about testing directly for the virus with the swab, 
or are we talking about antibody testing? They tell us two different things. The swabs tell us who has active infection. The antibody tests tell us who has a history of infection. So testing is important, but depending on the type, it gives you different information. But is 2% enough? I mean, I think that, it, that that's a tough question. I think the key is not necessarily the exact number, but making sure we're testing the right people, the most vulnerable populations. Those patients need to be tested aggressively. And the parts of the country that are seeing clusters, so I don't want to say the hot zones because then we've waited too long. We want to surround ourselves with testing aggressively, both symptomatic and asymptomatic, asymptomatic individuals in those places where we're seeing a spike in the number of cases. All right, and just one more question for you. With more people also getting antibody testing at this point, do you think that we could ever move to a system of so-called passport immunity, allowing those who have tested positive to return to work in public life? So, Lindsay, it's a great theory, but I don't think that's ready for prime time. Why? Because most of the country will test negative. The prevalence, although we don't know exactly, we've even seen in New York City, the city that has the greatest number of cases in the world, that even in that city, that's the ultimate hot zone, most patients test negative, only 20 percent. And that's on the high end. So I think, unfortunately, most of us will not be able to hold that passport right now and show positive testing. Okay, thank you for that information. We appreciate it. And now to cities in America that are coming back to life after lockdown. It can certainly be complicated. Georgia's governor was one of the first to let some of his state's businesses reopen. While many are thrilled to be back in business, others are worried that the move was too soon for a state that still has more than 24,000 coronavirus cases. Fred Castellucci owns seven Atlanta restaurants and is with us now to tell us more about why he thinks that it's premature to fully reopen. Fred, thanks so much for joining us. So uh, hopefully we have your signal. I couldn't hear you just there, but want to start off by asking you, you're one of more than 50 restaurant owners in Atlanta who took out a full page ad in the Atlanta Journal Constitution today, asserting that you will not yet reopen your dine in businesses. Why make that move? I just want to make sure we hear you now. Um, yeah, so the decision was just one that we believe there's strength in numbers here. Um, you know, we're working hard to serve the community. We believe that, you know, through our takeout and delivery options, that's the best way, the safest way that we can save, uh, serve the community at this moment. And really, it's about the safety of our staff and our guests um, and really the community at large. And, and we feel as though it's just a bit premature at the moment uh, to open our dining rooms and, and, you know, have another element that we can't control. Okay, so again, you're, you're saying that the governor's decision was, was to reopen was premature. What would have been a better plan, and what will it take for you to feel comfortable opening your dining rooms once again? It's just there's no good decisions here. You know, we're all faced with uh, very, very difficult decisions as individual business owners on when to open. And I know that the governor had uh, a lot of uh, elements that, you know, he went into that decision to reopen the, the businesses here in Georgia. Um, and I know that was challenging, and it's challenging for us as individual business owners. And so, you know, I think as we look forward, what what's going to be the, the best thing moving forward for us um, is just, you know, when we see cases drop uh, to a low enough number that, you know, the risk is less. And you're still operating takeout services at some of your restaurants. You have uh, never had to offer takeout only before. But is that enough to sustain your business? And are you worried about the future of your restaurants and the people that you employ? Fred, I think we've lost him the difficulties of relying solely on technology in these days of COVID-19. The pandemic has, of course, been stressful for so many of us these past few weeks, but imagine being unable to see or hear on top of it. That's the reality for tens of thousands of deaf and blind Americans. When we come back, the personal stories of how they're coping during these difficult times. Plus, from the Hill to the front lines, one congressman explains why he's volunteering to treat COVID-19 patients in his home state and what that experience is teaching him about this pandemic. And an urgent warning from Homeland Security, how video calls could be at risk from spying foreign governments. But first, here are some of the trending headlines on abcnews.com.
stories of our time, anytime. Nightline. Your mom said, comb your hair. Your dad told you, smart up. Your dog is judging you right now. And your best friend just called you crazy. We all need someone who'll pull no punches and give it to us straight. Now imagine getting your news like that. No bull, no spin, just give it to me straight. Straightforward news, straight to the heart of the story. ABC News, straightforward. The Americans here on the ground and the Iraqis. 18,000 tons. Matatas. Ismail? Yes. David. David. see just home after home. David, thanks for meeting us. This was your view. My favorite view. Thank you for coming. Good morning, sunshine. Good morning, sunshine. Good morning, sunshine. sense of it all now afternoons on ABC one place with the good information you need we are all in this together and we're going to get through this together pandemic what you need to know afternoons at 1 Eastern 12 Central and Pacific on ABC What you're hearing and seeing is the military's Blue Angels and Thunderbirds fly over in New York City, roaring past all five boroughs and some other American cities today in honor of those health care workers on the front lines of the COVID-19 crisis. And take a look at this. People in New York forgetting just for a moment those social distancing rules as they try to get a glimpse of those jets. And you may not have heard of it just a few months ago, but with the nation now on lockdown and millions working from home, the video service Zoom has become the go-to for many looking to connect with friends, family, and coworkers. But there's now a new warning from Homeland Security officials on whether Zoom could be vulnerable to spying. ABC News Chief Justice Correspondent Pierre Thomas has those details. It's the video meeting app increasingly popular in the era of social distancing. But today, the Department of Homeland Security is deeply concerned the Zoom users may be vulnerable to spying by foreign governments. Zoom, now seeing 300 million daily meeting participants, could be used to eavesdrop on citizens and be an opportunity for espionage, according to that new Homeland Security bulletin. It flatly states... Any organization currently using or considering using Zoom should evaluate the risk of its use. Hostile intelligence services may use this as an opportunity to collect information that they normally would not have access to. A particular concern, according to the intelligence analysis, China, the country where some of Zoom's development is done. The document warning China's access to Zoom servers makes Beijing uniquely positioned to target U.S. public and private sector users. Many people are working from home and having discussions they normally would have at work uh, remotely. So if you choose to use those type of systems uh, out of convenience, then you're making yourself vulnerable to this type of uh, espionage. The alert comes less than a month after the FBI warned that hackers were able to interrupt calls with obscene or disruptive messages, so-called Zoom bombing. Like this one that disrupted a town board meeting earlier this month. Black people. Since then, Zoom has increased security, including adding password protection to calls. And a Zoom spokesperson telling ABC News the company disagrees with the intelligence analysis, calling it heavily misinformed, adding that workers in China lack the power or access to make substantive changes to our platforms or the means to access any meeting content. And Pierre Thomas joins us now. Pierre, what else is Zoom saying in response to this Homeland Security Bulletin? Well, they're saying that they have layers of security and that they're constantly updating to deal with privacy challenges. And they say any Zoom meetings that take place outside of China are not routed through servers there. Pierre Thomas for us tonight. Thank you so much.
Coming up next, President Trump says he will order meat processing plants to stay open during this outbreak. But with thousands of COVID-19 cases coming from these types of places, does that put workers at risk? Plus, a new warning from the American Academy of Pediatrics. Why, even in a lockdown, you should still keep your latest checkup. In times like these, the news-making events happen here. ABC News. President Trump meeting face-to-face -face with one of the world's most brutal dictators, Kim Jong-un. The president. Do you trust him? I do trust him, yeah. I think he trusts me, and I trust him. Ivanka Trump. I have to ask you about your emails. Your father had taken Hillary Clinton to task for this. There just is no equivalency. So the idea of lock her up doesn't apply to you? No. <laughs> Comey. How strange is it for you to sit here and compare the president to a mob boss? Very strange. Michelle Obama. What do you wish you could tell your pre-White House self? Whew. Melania Trump. Do you think there's still people there that he can't trust? Yes. Still working now? Yes. Michael Cohen. So he's still lying? Yes. It's a big statement. And now, in a year with so much on the line, we're right there. Good evening tonight from Washington, a very busy news night. America's number one news source, ABC News, straightforward. We all need someone who'll pull no punches and give it to us straight. No bull, no spin. Now, imagine getting your news like that. Just give it to me straight. ABC News, straightforward. Can you tell us your full name for the record? Jeffrey Edward Epstein. Every girl that meets Jeffrey starts off with giving him a massage. He's like, I'll pay you $200 for every girl that you bring to me. Who else was underage? All of them. All of them. He told me the younger the better. How did he get so rich? How did he get away with it for so long? And what do the women who survived his crimes now have to say? <laughs> Truth and Lies, Jeffrey Epstein. Listen free now on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. What's the most innovative daily news podcast out there to listen to every day? Well, the Edward R. Murrow Awards say it's Start Here, the daily news podcast from ABC News. Even the New York Times calls us a top news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, free on Apple Podcasts. Welcome back. Now to a new warning on a potential impact of COVID-19 on children. Let's take a look by the numbers. The American Academy of Pediatrics represents 67,000 pediatricians across the country, and it's sounding the alarm to remind parents that annual visits should not stop because of COVID-19. The organization says that as many as 80% of the children in the U.S. are not seeing their pediatricians during the pandemic, and that could mean that children are missing key vaccines. One health records company found a 50% drop in childhood vaccines given for diseases like measles and mumps and the New York New York Times reports a 73 percent drop in HPV vaccines and according to global health organizations this issue could be worldwide more than 100 million children could be at risk of contracting measles after some two dozen low and middle income countries have now suspended national immunization programs and when we come back the incredible struggles facing deaf and blind Americans during this pandemic, how they're surviving, and even pitching in to help their communities. Plus, unfortunately for this little guy, it appears that pets are not immune to COVID-19. But before you worry too much, his story does indeed have a happy ending. And our tweet of the day, an unfortunate incident for our colleague Will Reeve this morning on GMA. No coronavirus has affected so many of you. America has changed for now. There's no question about that. People are finding a way to come together. What else should people know about how to care for their families through this? And you feel it's not too late to flatten the curve? It's not too late. When do we expect to have a vaccine? George, we are all thinking of you, Allie, and the kids. How are you feeling? I feel fine, Robin. She wanted to share this message. You know I'm feverish if I'm on national television with no makeup on. Allie is now on the Roberts family prayer chain. Robin, how you doing? I'm loving this. Oh, Gonna keep ah. these slippers on. We are so grateful that we get to do this from home. I'm gonna take the camera and turn it around. <laughs> Kelly was doing prompter. You do know your sideways, right? <laughs> Great to see so many Americans stepping up. All in this together. The world coming together as one. We're gonna get through this together. Right here with you on Good Morning America. 
we know coronavirus has affected so many of you. America has changed for now, there's no question about that. People are finding a way to come together. What else should people know about how to care for their families through this? And you feel it's not too late to flatten the curve? It's not too late. When do we expect to have a vaccine? George, we are all thinking of you, Allie, and the kids. How are you feeling? I feel fine, Robin. She wanted to share this message. You know I'm feverish if I'm on national television with no makeup on. Allie is now on the Roberts family prayer chain. Robin, how are you doing? I'm loving this. Oh. Going to keep these slippers on. We are so great grateful that we get to do this from home. I'm going to take the camera and turn it around. <laughs> Kelly was doing prompter. You do know you're sideways, right? <laughs> it's great to see so many Americans stepping up. All in this together. The world coming together as one. We're going to get through this together. Right here with you on Good Morning America. States clamoring for more aggressive testing as they push to reopen, the White House unveiling a blueprint they say will get states the resources they need. Now that we've expanded testing dramatically and CDC has altered the criteria for testing, I think you'll see as, as governors have unlocked more and more potential in their laboratories. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis, an ardent supporter of the president, assured Trump in the Oval Office today. But we still, right now, are able to meet the current demand. So you actually have more testing than you have demand. Right now, yep. It's a fantastic thing. But the responsibility for testing still falls on the states, and critics say the Trump administration's plan doesn't provide solutions as to how to administer the high volume of tests they need, and not every state has passed its apex. I had approximately 18 patients in the ED. It's just been a trickle of patients, but the volume has not been high over the past few days. Today, the Thunderbirds and the Blue Angels honoring their work with formation flights over New York, New Jersey, and Philadelphia. Household staples have been flying off the store shelves since the coronavirus outbreak hit the U.S. nearly two months ago. However, expect some luck this week with toilet paper and paper towels. Manufacturers in the U.S. have been amping up production. But the virus also continues to disrupt the country's food supply, as farmers say they have been forced to discard excess produce and milk and livestock. One of the country's largest meat providers, Tyson Foods, says the food supply chain in America is breaking and predicting limited supply and higher prices for their product. COVID-19 has forced 13 of the country's largest meat plants to close. And I'm really thrilled to have my friend, the former senator and former secretary of state and the woman who should be president of the United States right now, Hillary Clinton. Joe Biden getting the endorsement of Hillary Clinton today during his online virtual town hall. I am thrilled uh, to be part of your campaign to not only endorse you, but to help highlight a lot of the issues that are at stake uh, in this presidential election. Possible tornadoes, giant hail, and damaging winds from Texas all the way up to Illinois. A tornado watch across several states before this entire system then moves east. Today, President Trump said that he will use the Defense Production Act to order meat processing plants to stay open, classifying them as critical infrastructure. The government also says it will provide extra protective gear for employees along with new safety guidance. This comes as the White House said it fears as much as 80 percent of U.S. meat production could shut down because of the pandemic. For more on this, let's bring in ABC's Terry Moran. Terry, extra safety gear is great, of course, but after more than 6,000 people working at these places either got sick or had to go into isolation, is this really safe? Lindsay, we are about to find out. Uh, meat processing plants, as we have found across the country, are hot spots by their nature because workers are so crammed in for efficiency purposes and for cleanliness purposes, but they are right next to each other, and it is one of America's major industries. So we are seeing a showdown between the giant companies which provide uh, the meat and the food for America's inexhaustible appetite for meat and the workers and activists who fear that they are at risk. As you say, uh, thousands have fallen ill with COVID, and, and this is something going forward that they are very concerned about. The president brought the hammer down using the Defense Production Act to force these plants to stay open because, as the head of Tyson said over the weekend, the American food supply chain is breaking. So it is an urgent problem 
that the president is addressing with a, a very dramatic solution. And, and the president also said he wanted to address liability problems. What does he mean by that exactly? You know, it's unclear, Lindsay. Liability means lawsuits. And there is, uh, we have asked the White House, they aren't quite clear with us on what they mean. Uh, but it is, it, it, what, what the companies seem to be looking for is protection from liability for workers who fall sick or die from COVID because they have been forced to work in a plant which has become a hotspot of the coronavirus pandemic. That is how extreme things are, though. The president is using, it looks like, the force of law, which will protect the giant companies uh, that provide America's meat supply with liability protections from its workers who will be forced to go to work. One of the things that this entire pandemic is teaching us is how fragile our supply chains are and how concentrated they are in the hands of a few great big businesses. That's what this is. Big business on one side, which provides this essential uh, American staple of our diets, meats, and on the other hand, the workers and activists uh, and the unions who are essentially facing them down over the issue of life and death. And, and also, the president has been hesitant to use the Defense Production Act in other areas. So why use it now? Uh, you know, I, I think a couple of things. First, I think those liability protections are, are brought in under the Defense Production Act. That is a very strong law, and, and this is a very dramatic gesture for the president to do. But I think also because the president was told that we are not far away from the unthinkable in America, food shortages. I've been in countries where there have been food shortages. It's demoralizing. It's frightening to the public. And in a country as bounteous as America is, where plenteous food on our tables is part of our national identity, to confront the prospect that the food supply chain is breaking, uh, that's devastating uh, to the president's claims that we are ready to go back to work, that everything is under control. It would be devastating to him politically and psychologically damaging to the morale of the American public. I think that was one of the big drivers here for him to act as dramatically as he has here. Although at the end of the day, while the companies are getting protection from liability, the protection for the workers is only going to be issued, it looks like, in guidelines, basically suggestions from the government to separate the workers, to provide them with protective gear. 65-year-old workers and older, you know, might want to be able to stay home. Uh, there'll be no teeth, it looks like, in enforcement of safety procedures for the workers who must now go to work in these plants, which have become some of the biggest hotspots in America. Lindsay? Right, so it sounds like the businesses would then be policing themselves. Terry Moran, thank you so much for that. Uh, the pressing need for food is being felt by so many Americans across this country, with many food banks seeing endless lines in recent weeks. And with the baseball season on hold today, the home of the Chicago Cubs was transformed into an unlikely food pantry with volunteers at Wrigley Field handing out groceries to those struggling to make ends meet. ABC's Alex Perez was there. Hey, Lindsay, because of the pandemic, the need for food for a lot of people is only growing. Now, we are inside Chicago's iconic Wrigley Field. As we know, baseball is on pause, but take a look behind me here. This concourse is very busy right now, filled with volunteers who are filling up these boxes for food for people who need them. There are lots of people lining up to get this food. We talked to a few of those people. For some of them, it was their first time having to come to a pantry to feed their families. I never thought I'd see a day that it would be like this strenuous, you know, just trying to stay afloat. Everyday necessities such as food, you know, it's rough. It's like new to me because I didn't, I, like, I never did this. And yeah, it's a lot different. Really hard because then I feel like, do I really need this? Or there's some people that really, really need this? There's no, you know, no incomes. We don't, don't, you know, working in a bar, we're, we're, can't be night to night. So it's, it's, it, you know, it was unexpected. Are you worried about the months to come? You said you might not work until August 1st. Uh, a little bit. Yeah. Kind of have to take it as it comes, I guess. It helps out, you know, it could be 20, 30, 40 bucks, whatever they have for us, you know, and it, it all helps out. So you work concessions right here at Wrigley, and instead right of coming to work, you're coming to pick up some food. Yes. Is that a difficult thing? No. It's not. It's keeping me hopeful, so, like I say, I'm coming up here for food today. Hopefully, I'll be coming back to work soon. 
Volunteers will spend hours filling the boxes for people who need the food. In it, they'll find about two weeks worth of food. There's produce, there's meat, there's eggs, even milk. We are committed to making sure that we can get food to people who need it most. Um, we don't know when this is gonna, I don't, I don't think anyone has a crystal ball and can tell us, right? Um, so we're actively recruiting donors and volunteers and food donors to make sure that we can continue to meet the increased need that we're seeing. So the boxes of food that people walk away with here are filled with about two weeks worth of groceries. Organizers tell us since the pandemic, the demand for food has grown by about 300%. Lindsay? 300% are thanks to you, Alex. And when we uh, and we return now to the critical questions of when and how the country should reopen and how we're doing on testing. Joining us now is Dr. Roger Marshall, U.S. Congressman from Kansas and also a physician. Thanks so much for joining us. Lindsay, glad to be on. I appreciate you covering the issue. So you are a member of the House, but you've also been volunteering to treat COVID-19 patients and administer testing. What have you witnessed on the front lines of this crisis? Well, you know, first of all, just the, the great work that doctors and nurses are doing, communities coming together. So President Trump is giving us all the tools that we need to be, to be doing this testing down in southwest Kansas, where 20 percent of the beef for America is processed. So uh, this has just been a great community effort. I'm so proud of what we're doing here. We're on an uptick on the virus, but, but we're figuring it out. And your state, Kansas, has plans to lift stay-at-home restrictions on Monday. Are you concerned about the virus spreading once this happens? You know, as a doctor, I'm always concerned. And certainly in southwest Kansas, it's a different story than the eastern third of the state. Uh, Wichita, the biggest popular uh, population in the state, I think had one new case yesterday. So I think Wichita is ready to go. There's a lot of rural communities that are ready to go. We have to stay focused on a responsible, safe way to do it. And it's going to be the responsibility of every community to keep practicing those, those simple social skills like washing your hands, staying home if you're sick, avoiding crowds, those types of things. So so we're figuring out one county at a time. And you talk about those counties in terms of being ready to go. What exactly has Kansas done to prepare to reopen? And are you confident that it's enough? Yeah, I think, first of all, we've had, we do have an ample amount of testing. I was able to call a, a private company just last week and ask them for 6,000 tests to come down here to help us out with the packing plant issue. And overnight, they're able to ship 6,000 tests. So in the meantime, over the past two weeks, I've been visiting with businesses across the state, getting geared up to come up with a plan. Now, not every business is ready to open up. Uh, but I think, like, for instance, healthcare, we need to open up some of the outpatient surgery. Lindsay, what I'm concerned about today as a physician is the mental health of people. If we don't get this economy opened up in a safe, healthy fashion, in a responsible fashion, we're going to have more people die from suicide and health conditions related to poverty than we do from the virus. So we have to figure out a way to do both. Well, I, I think that you have an interesting perspective in that you have one foot kind of in the political world and then another foot in the medical world. President Trump says that his administration has done a good job on testing. Would you agree with that? And also, how important do you think that testing is to determining when states are ready to reopen? He, he's just done a good job. He's done an incredible job. What people don't realize is way back in early February, when the president realized the CDC was having a little hiccup, he reached out to private enterprise. If he hadn't done that back in February, I don't think there's any way I could have asked for 6,000 tests last week and had them shipped here overnight. So I think the president intuitively has stayed ahead of the game. Uh, we have all the resources we knew right, need right here in southwest K Kansas to keep these critically necessary food processing plants open. So I think he's done an incredible job. And so you don't think that there's ever been a testing shortage in your area? Oh, absolutely. In, in the beginning, there was, but it certainly wasn't on the president's back. Uh, the CDC messed up to begin with, but in, but incredibly, it's been ramped up at a, just a phenomenal fashion. Sure, but he's been saying I from the beginning, the, the, he's been saying from the beginning, yeah. oh, there are enough tests, they're beautiful, they're perfect. But you're saying that there were not enough tests at that time, right? I'm not saying we're not well, part, I, I saying think blame. In the beginning, there was challenges. Everybody that needed a test got a test. But today is a different situation. When we're trying to open up businesses, when we're trying to keep a critical infrastructure uh, plant like a, like a packing plant open, then we have to reach down a little bit deeper and we need more testing now than we did 
two months ago. Curious also to get your take on, you know, the debate uh, right now about whether the federal government should provide economic aid to hard-hit states. Mitch McConnell has suggested that struggling states should declare bankruptcy. Where do you stand on this? Well, I, I think a little common sense goes a long ways. I'm the physician, like you said. I want to see where this, uh, the, the $3 trillion we rolled out, where that all lands. The, the, no matter what legislation we write in Washington, nothing works until we get this economy safely and responsibly going again. So let's see where we are a month from now. I, 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 don't, certainly, I don't think the federal government should bail out states that have made some irresponsible decisions over the past decades. So let's stay focused on get, getting this coronavirus virus under control, stay focused on getting businesses open in a safe, responsible fashion, and let's revisit this in two weeks or a month. Congressman, thank you so much for your time. We appreciate it. Yeah, thank you so much. God bless you. This pandemic, with its months of quarantine and economic turmoil, has certainly been stressful, to say the least, for many of us. But imagine being unable to see or hear throughout this difficult time. Well, tens of thousands of deaf and blind Americans are coming to terms with a new normal during COVID-19, one that's challenging their ability not only to survive, but thrive. Here's ABC's Devin Dwyer. For most of us, sights and sounds of the COVID emergency have been inescapable. The number of cases of coronavirus spiking here in the U.S. This is a terrible experience. But for some Americans, the scope of this outbreak has been uniquely difficult to face. My name is Philip Wismer. I am deafblind. Philip Wismer, a student at Gallaudet University in Washington, D.C., is one of an estimated 40,000 Americans facing COVID-19 while unable to clearly see or hear. I have not gone off campus since March 18th. I only come out of my dorm to get food, get the mail, and that's about it. It sounds lonely. Yeah, it is. Sometimes I, I do feel um, lonely. My other friends that are completely blind are feeling very, very isolated. Deafblind Americans survive by touch, hand over hand to communicate, fingers on braille signs for mobility, hugs and handshakes to feel connected. Experts say deaf blindness is a spectrum. Not everyone experiences complete darkness and total silence. But touch is critical and now comes with significant health risks. Our way of communicating and our culture, everything relies on touch. And now we're not allowed to touch. The requirement to stay six feet away from other people is actually not safe for me. As a blind person, I need to touch my guide. And many guides are fearful of being touched and touching back. Being home alone is a very big issue that we're faced with today. We're talking about all the things that could happen, additional suicides and certain things like that. 28-year-old Tyler Samuel of Nashville, Tennessee, says she's fighting that loneliness, relying on her partner for help with daily tasks. A genetic condition since birth has degraded her hearing and sight. Through my youth, just really worried that I wasn't, wouldn't find that independence. And when you do find it, you don't want to lose it. And so for it to be kind of chipped away is, um, it kind of lowers your self-esteem. Samuel still walks to work every day by herself. This is my now kind of empty walk home. A pediatric surgery coordinator at Vanderbilt University Hospital. She's a freelance opera singer with dreams of going big. But the pandemic has prompted some soul searching. I lost a friend uh, a few weeks ago to, to COVID, and she was very young and um, in her 30, early 30s. And it kind of prompted me to go ahead and get my advanced directive and my will together. And um, it's something that I wanted like my wishes to be known. A trip to the hospital is what many deafblind Americans told ABC News they fear most. There's an assumption in a lot of medical communities that it's better to be deaf than disabled. Haben Gurma is a leading advocate for the community. I would be deeply terrified. Of, I would not get communication access, that I would not get the care I needed if I were to get the virus and go to the hospital. She says it's a fight for equality. The daughter of an Eritrean refugee, Gurma is the first deafblind woman to graduate from Harvard Law School. In 2015, President Obama recognized her as a champion of change. When I'm asking you the questions today, Hobbin, you're actually feeling my questions with your fingers. 
When you ask me questions, I'm feeling the questions. With her special Braille keyboard and guide dog Milo by her side, Gurma and an informal network of deafblind advocates are determined not to be forgotten. It's certainly not um, sexy to have a disability and to deal with deaf blindness, I think, makes people very, um, you know, uncomfortable generally. Rebecca Alexander of New York City wants the world to know that deaf blind professionals can pitch in too. She's volunteering her services as a counselor to hospital workers on the front lines. I'm just knowing that even someone like me, who the community, I think at large, if they knew how limited my vision and my hearing was, they might not consider me as someone they would reach out to for help. And um, it does feel good to be able to provide that. Ashley Benton, who coordinates services for the deafblind in North Carolina, says police in rural areas are checking on residents who don't have technology to communicate. They contacted us when it was beautiful. And so... We were able to work with the officers who have the appropriate PPE to go in and check on this deafblind consumer to make sure that they were safe. It's so important because we're all going through this together. Near Seattle, deafblind sisters Nancy and Debbie Summer sticking together through it all. We have to touch each other. Without that, we can't connect at all. I mean, thank goodness we have computers and smartphones and we can talk with each other with friends. And that's so much better than nothing, right, Debbie? a persistence to stay connected and to contribute to the recovery. Figure out what you can do to give back and help your community. The deafblind community raising its voice in its own way. What are you liking to sing these days? I love Queen. I liked it all of Bohemian Rhapsody. And like so many, dreaming of that big escape after COVID. What I would like to do after this is all over with is take a vacation. Just thankful for what they still can touch. I'm just keeping my fingers crossed that everything will be ready to open again and hoping that the COVID-19 decreases. For ABC News Live, I'm Devin Dwyer in Washington. Thanks so much to Devin for that. It was one of the first questions that many asked when this pandemic first started. Can pets get the virus? Well, tonight we're getting details on one of the first COVID cases in a dog. This is Winston, the pug. He lives in North Carolina. Dr. Heather McLean says that she and her family came down with COVID in March and recovered. Her entire family, including Winston, joined a study at Duke University. His results came back positive on Friday. Good news, McLean says they are all doing much better. The CDC recommends that you treat your pets just as you would any family member right now. No interaction with people or animals outside of your house and isolate your pet from anyone who gets sick. And now a look at what may be the pharmacy of the future. Will Reeve has those details. This morning, the flying pharmacies of the future. Drones delivering medication to patients wherever they are. In this case, the villages in Florida. CVS and UPS announcing a joint partnership to deliver prescriptions to the nation's largest retirement community of over 135,000 residents. The venture aims to keep the retirees in the villages, a vulnerable population, at home safe and socially distanced amid the coronavirus pandemic while getting them their medication fast. CVS Executive Vice President and Chief Operating Officer John Roberts saying in a statement, Now more than ever, it's important that our customers have access to their prescriptions. This drone delivery service provides an innovative method to reach some of our customers. In cooperation with the FAA, the drones will start with flights of under one mile with an eye on expansion. Not only are we proud of that and helping the customers, but it also is getting the goods that they need for their health back sooner. Thanks to Will. Coming up, are you missing interaction or living your best life in lockdown? It's the same for these guys. Our VIP tour inside the Denver Zoo, including meeting one of their newest residents. Plus, the story behind this photo, against all odds, how these two ended up back together. How do you make sense of it all? Now, afternoons on ABC, one place with the good information you need. We are all in this together, and we're going to get through this together. Pandemic, what you need to know. Afternoons at 1 Eastern, 12 Central and Pacific on ABC. In times like these, the news-making events happen here. ABC News. President Trump meeting face-to-face -face with one of the world's most brutal dictators, Kim Jong-un. The president. You trust him. I do trust him, yeah. I think he trusts me, and I trust him. Ivanka Trump. I have to ask you 
about your emails. Your father had taken Hillary Clinton to task for this. There just is no equivalency. So the idea of lock her up doesn't apply to you? No. Comey. How strange is it for you to sit here and compare the president to a mob boss? Very strange. Michelle Obama. What do you wish you could tell your pre-White House self? Whew. Melania Trump. Do you think there's still people there that he can't trust? Yes. Still working out? Yes. Michael Cohen. So he's still lying? Yes. It's a big statement. And now, in a year with so much on the line, we're right there. Good evening tonight from Washington, a very busy news night. America's number one news source, ABC News, straightforward. Friday nights, 9, 8 central, true crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime, 2020, Friday nights, 9, 8 central on ABC. The world may feel out of your control, but your happiness doesn't have to be. Learn the secrets to happiness. Listen to the 10% Happier podcast, free on Apple Podcasts. ABC News, honored winner of four Edward R. Murrow Awards, including the most prestigious honor, overall excellence in television. ABC News, America's number one news choice. ABC News, America's number one news source. Straightforward news, straight to the heart of the story. ABC News, straightforward. Welcome back, everyone. You are looking at a field of tulips just outside of Amsterdam. The Dutch farmer is using the flowers to spread a message of encouragement to health care workers. You can see it there. Stay strong. Sales from the Radiant Bloom, dubbed the Stay Strong Tulips, will go to an initiative raising money for Doctors Without Borders. Of course, we're all handling social distancing a little bit differently. And for some, it's a welcome break. For others, it's downright brutal. As Clayton Sandell shows us, it's no different for residents of the Denver Zoo. At the Denver Zoo, the flamingos are on the loose. Getting a little exercise on pathways that used to be crowded with people. We just added more flamingos and have just been venturing further and further. With the zoo closed thanks to coronavirus, keepers say some animals miss those crowds. This is our emu. Take Ralph. We've definitely noticed that anytime anyone walks by, he's he's right at the front here and, and checking us out. Yuri is normally shy for a tiger. He's very good. Oh, there he is actually right there. But lately, he's showing more of his stripes. He's been a little bit more exploratory in his environment. He's started to try and explore this catwalk above your head. The giraffes are rubbernecking more than usual. Uh, we're getting a lot of stares. <laughs> Specifically from Dobby. He is very people oriented. And for Tundra the grizzly, the zoo even smells different. They can smell miles and miles away. But without anybody here, she doesn't have that much new stuff to smell. The guest may be gone, but caring for nearly 3,000 animals is nonstop. We have a lot of essential staff from our animal care to our grounds and horticulture maintenance staff. A lot of people are doing a lot of work every day, seven days a week. After lions and tigers tested positive for COVID-19 at a New York zoo, everyone here is on guard. We're taking additional precautions with keepers that work with species that might be able to contract the virus. He's really smart, really sweet. With no crowds, Cindy Kasaboon and her fellow zookeepers have started spending lunchtime with some lonely orangutans. So this is Irina. She's probably the goofiest orangutan I've ever worked with. She's probably the one that misses the people the most. She just loves to play with people. The public still hasn't seen two-month-old rhino Juna in person, but keepers say there's an upside. Helping her get acclimated, it's a lot faster not having hundreds and hundreds of people screaming and excited and all of those things things can be potential added stressors. The elephants haven't forgotten the crowds either. Especially Chuck, he definitely has a knack for connecting with guests. But other beasts don't seem to be bothered. The kangaroos don't seem to care at all. They may have noticed the difference, but it doesn't really seem to be affecting their behavior very much. How weird is it to see this place <laughs> completely empty? It's been a little strange. The zoo is hoping that paying customers can come back soon. Animal care is costing about a million dollars a month, but until the pandemic is over, the zoo is, well, for the birds. Clayton Sandell, ABC News, Denver. For the birds, indeed. And before we go tonight, the image of the day. We have a theme going for you tonight, our animal theme. That is Eric Johnson and his dog, Bella. She disappeared when a tornado flattened their home in Putnam County, Tennessee, in early March. But tonight, 54 days later, man and best friend are reunited.
feels so good. That's our show for this hour. Stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us and good night.